Good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I work as a software engineer at the New York Times at the personalization team, where we basically build data pipelines and create recommender systems. And I am also like master's candidate in applied mathematics at Columbia University. I am focusing on the numerical analysis for partial differential equations. Um, so as he mentioned, like earlier this year, I gave a talk about uh, Kalman filters at PyCon US in Portland. Uh, it was like kind of a, a lighter talk. It was like more the like the textbook version of the Kalman filter, uh, and I needed to show something in Python because it was Python. So, um, and then like some months later, uh, unfortunately, Rudolf Kalman passed away. So I, I spoke to Sishan and uh, like if it was a good idea to honor his contribution to mathematics and engineering uh, by discussing his most famous paper, which is this one. Um, so here we are. I, I really hope you are not uh, disappointed because this is not a talk about distributed systems or consensus or <laughs> uh, machine learning or AI, uh, but this is still like very important. It's an old, very old paper, but it's being still implemented like all over the place. So this is a paper I love and I hope you love it too. Um, so this is Rudolf Kalman uh, receiving the National Medal of Science. Um, you can find the original paper in this uh, website, but I think that Sishan also posted it on the Meetup uh, website and uh, it's on the GitHub uh, site. So basically, like the first definition, like what is a Kalman filter? So it's an algorithm named after Rudolf Kalman. The original paper is called like very differently, but everybody knows it as the Kalman filter. So it's a prediction correction technique by which we calculate recursively the state of a dynamical system. We call this like uh, UK at some time TK, uh, but just given the previous state of the system and new information, new observations that comes in so um, this is this has been like described as deceptively simple because the implementation of this is very simple, but the analysis behind it is is not that simple. I mean, it's not complicated, but it's not that simple. So uh, this paper was published in 1960 uh, as the result of the project that was partially uh, supported by the U.S. Air Force. Um, the Kalman filter was first applied to the problem of the trajectory estimation for Apollo mission uh, and was incorporated into the Apollo uh, space navigation computer. Um, it, was also, it is also being used right now on the guidance of navigation systems of the NASA space shuttle and the position, like the, the attitude control of the International Space Station. So, as you may have realized, this has been like used mostly for positioning and navigation systems, but since this is a, a generalization of other problems, this can be applied to things like uh, computer vision, to data analysis. There might be like better tools for data analysis, but this can also work. So there is a transcription of the original code uh, that was uh, deployed on the, on the Apollo guidance computer. Uh, this is available for, for the public. It's published on this website that is uh, mentioned here. Um, it's funny because you probably remember that some time ago, like some months ago, there was a massive hype about someone that published the Apollo code on GitHub. Uh, and everybody was writing about it, uh, like, oh my God, this is the guy that put the code of Apollo mission on GitHub, but the truth is that this code that he has been on Google code for so many years and has been available there and you can just export it to GitHub like really easily. So um, if you go to this address, you can just export the code. Uh, so this code was implemented on AGC4 assembly language. Um, 
This AGC stands for Apollo Guidance Computer. And as you, this is like the header of one of the files that are in this repository. As you can see in the history, this dates from 2003, so it's not really nothing that happened this year. This has been available for forever. Um, so in general, the Kalman filter can be used for, the, for prediction problems in dynamical systems. Um, where we want to model time series that have a time varying mean and some additive noise. We are going to explain that later uh, because the Kalman filter is basically a generalization of the least squares model. So uh, there are some few things that I'd like to discuss with you before like going through the paper itself because some, there are things that are being mentioned and we need some background to, to understand this. Um, like there are some terminology and some descriptions that are needed to go there. They might look unnecessary at the beginning, but I promise it will make sense at the end. So there is an appendix on the paper about random processes. I'm not going to detail this. Uh, it's just that the basic notion is like if you have random vectors, but you know the distribution of these random vectors, you can basically uh, get the estimated value of them, like the long run average of these of this vectors. So you can read the appendix as like uh, probabilistic theory. Um, that are like they, they mentioned in so many places the dynamical systems. I didn't puts anything here, but just let's imagine that you have a problem like trajectory determination in a spacecraft. So how you determine where in the space is your spacecraft? So you, depending on the coordinate system that you use, you can, let's suppose that we are in Cartesian coordinates, so we have a position vector and a velocity vector. So that's everything I need to to determine my trajectory. So that those are my, um, my system variables, like my, the, the thing that he mentions in the paper that how to model a system using uh, a state equations and a, like a state transition equations. So we have like a matrix which represent, in this case that I am mentioning, it represents like the Hamiltonian operator in matrix form, and I have here my state vector, which is like two components, my position vector and my velocity vector. Each of them have three components, so it's like a six by one vector. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about uh, dynamic systems, but there are some topics that I'm going to go a little bit further on this. Uh, vector spaces, uh, least squares, and the normal equation. So, Let's start with vector spaces. So um, the notion of vector spaces is like really fundamental to the analysis of this problem. Um, it's fundamental for the convergence analysis of the solution. Convergence is like, okay, does my solution converges uh, to the true solution because this is an approximation and the stability analysis tell me like that's my solution blows up at some time in the future. So uh, in the paper this is not developed but he mentions that is, is material for a different paper that we're not discussing today but vector spaces are like critical for analysis of convergence, uh, for analysis of stability and uh, some things that we're going to see later. So vector spaces are also known as linear spaces. There's like a typo here. It's not a, a vector space. is not a space. It's uh, actually a subspace of uh, of vectors which have a metric. A metric is the notion of a norm of a distance between vectors, and they. I, you probably have seen this symbol of the two bars very often. Uh, but this vector space has to have these two properties. So let's say I have two vectors that are in my vector space. So the sum of them, if I have f and g in my vector space, f plus g 
uh, which is H should also uh, belong to my vector space. So this is very important because I want to find solutions in my vector space. Uh, the other, this is like the addition property. There's the scaling property is that if I have a scalar in real numbers, but it could also be complex numbers, uh, if I have a vector belonging to my vector space, and I multiply by this scalar, this has also to belong to my vector space. And this is, these two properties are very important. We will see later why. So uh, through the paper you have seen, if you have read it, that uh, he often like refers to vector spaces as uh, linear manifold. I prefer to use the term vector spaces because it's like easier to rationalize in your head, like linear manifold. It's, it's easier to imagine vectors, just vectors. So I'm going to use the vector spaces definition. So let's just start with the formulation of the least squares model and the normal equation. So uh, in, in, the, in the dynamical system section that we mentioned that we have uh, a state vector, and observations, and let's say we have just a linear system that is defined by a set of equations in matrix form. So I have this matrix A that can be n by n. I have my vector, which is my state vector. This vector would be the one that contains my uh, position and velocity. And I have B, which is my, the, the output, my observations. So A is n by n, U and B are n vectors. Uh, that, that refers that I have like n uh, equations of states in this case. Uh, so I think that most of us know that for something like this, if we want to solve for U, which is my state vector, I just, if, and if A is a square, I can just invert it, I mean, if, uh, if it's not singular if the columns are linearly independent. So I can just invert A and solve for U. So U is equal to A inverse B. But what if A is not square? What if it's, I have like more rows than columns? So M is bigger than N. Uh, so we can't really solve this system because we cannot invert a, a rectangular matrix. So, Right now, what I have here is like the situation that the system is overdetermined because I have more equations than unknowns. So uh, we are trying to fit M measurements for just two equations. So there is an example here. Let's say you have a set of 100 points that all of them fit a, a, a straight line but uh, the only two parameters you need for determining these straight lines are two, are Cx and D, and I have 100 equations. So I am solving 100 equations for just two unknowns. So what can I do there? So what we can do is to find an estimate for my, my state vector. So how I want this estimate to work, I want to minimize my squared error, that in this case is just my observation minus the, the equation matrix uh, multiplying my estimation to the square. So if you see here, I am just uh, replacing this U here with my estimate and I am subtracting from my observation. So uh, this would be my squared error. So uh, right now, what I want is to solve for my estimate of U in that way that I minimize this, this error. So what we can do is let's take this equation again and multiply by A transpose at both sides. So we have something like this, A transpose A U my estimate is equal to A transpose B, so we can check dimensions here. So A transpose is N by M, and then A is N by N, so I ended up with A transpose A, which is now a square matrix. 
So this is called a normal equation, and if my, again, if my columns are linearly independent and my determinant is not zero, I can invert this matrix, and I can solve for my estimate. So this is uh, the, like the solution for the ordinary list squares. So that's like the background we needed to go through the paper. Uh, now, what is, what, what's the motivation for writing this paper? Uh, I'm pretty sure that in the, in the first page of the paper, you can read that there were a solution for this kind of problems by a guy called Wiener, Wiener, I guess it's pronounced Wiener, I don't know. Um, but this, this, this solution had like many problems. He listed like seven different problems for this, but the two main problems are that the optimal solution for the winner filter of that calculating these estimations was the impulse response of the system to, uh, to, to generate my optimal uh, filter. The problem is that you know that an impulse is like this infinite delta that goes up to infinity, but is like infinitesimally narrow, and uh, that if you integrate uh, over some, uh, over some interval, it's one. So it's infinitely tall, but infinitesimally like narrow. And this is an analytical solution. So we really, really want to code this in a computer. So normally, the numerical determination for this kind of uh, resp impulse response is, is not easy, it's complex, and doesn't perform really well. So uh, we don't really want to do that. Or at least in 1960, we didn't really want to do that. But I think that it, it's, it's also the case today because we need to take in mind that this, this solution is in a, in a computer that is on a, on a rocket or a, a spacecraft. It's not in AWS or anything. So we really, really need this to be perform performing really well. Okay, so what is the situation? What we need to solve? So we are given a signal. Let's say it's a signal that we got from a GPS satellite. And uh, this signal is Y of T, um, and it's a sum of two things. The sum of my true signal, which is X1, and the noise that comes with my observation, which is x2. So what can we say about something that we haven't observed yet, but we want to predict at some time t1? I mean, predict is not the correct word because there are like these conditions. If t1 is a time that I haven't observed, but is in the past because it's less than current time t, so it's called a smoothing problem because I am just trying to, um, to fix or to correct my past estimates. If it's, this, it's current time, it's just a filtering problem, and if it's in the future, it's a prediction problem. So in this situation that we have now, if you, if you go through the paper, he starts narrowing the problem. Okay, uh, we have this signal, this signal is random. This uh, signal have a distribution, so there's like more to come. So the signal, the noise, and the sum of them are random variables, but if we know the probability distribution of them, we can get their expected values. So these expected values are like the, the long drawn averages of, of these random vectors. So the thing is that if, if I can, like generate an estimate that is based on the statistical distribution of random variables. If it's a function of this, so it's not longer random, so I can actually like give this estimate based on my random variables here. So the paper shows like uh, there are I think five theorems. Two of them are in the, in the appendix, uh, because are just related with, uh, with probability theory, but we are going to go through today to uh, theorem one and theorem two, which are the, the, like the most important for general results. So theorem one, 
This is what I have. So I have a statistical estimate of a random variable. So I have this big X at time one given time t. So this is the estimate of my little x uh, variable uh, given what I, I have observed in previous time. So this is like the, a conditional that we have here. So when the actual value of this x1 variable comes in, what I need to do is to actually assign a penalty or a loss for, um, for incorrect estimates. So we have here this estimation error, which is just the true value minus my estimation. So we need to define uh, something that is called in the paper as a loss function. Uh, this loss function is a non-decreasing function of the error because we, if we if we need to uh, accumulate these errors because as as my errors get bigger, my my penalty should be bigger. So there are some assumptions that we need to do about this um, uh, loss function. We have here that, of course, if the error is zero, I should assign like a penalty of zero. Uh, the second condition is what I just mentioned. If the if error two is bigger than one, bigger than zero, so the penalty should be bigger in each case. And this must be symmetric, so I should assign the same penalty to Epsilon or minus epsilon. So the most natural way to to choose a loss function is to choose the one that minimizes my my average loss. So what is the average loss of my loss function that is based on random variables? Is this expected value that uh, we can show here? So this result, like we need to minimize this, my expected value of my loss function given all my observations in the past. This comes from the, the theorem one, and it holds because if we assume that x1 and x2 are Gaussian variables and has Gaussian distribution, uh, like the this conditional that we have here because we have this probability of x1 and the other estimation, and we have the probability distribution for the y variable. A conditional uh, probability for two Gaussians is also Gaussian, so we definitely can uh, minimize this problem. Um, the good news is that there are like many, many processes in nature that are Gaussian. I'm sure that you have heard all about white noise. Um, like in fluid mechanics, uh, like the, the the distribution of velocities is in the in the different layers of the fluid. It's also uh, Gaussian. Um, the momentum, like masses, like like there are many things in nature that are Gaussian. So this is good news. Um, Yeah, is the the lower case? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. He's asking if the lower case one is a random variable. Yes. Oh, yes. So that's the random variable, and the 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 big X is my estimate based on the distribution of the random variable. This is a very simple question. You mentioned earlier that we knew the probability distributions. So why do we have to assume that it's a Gaussian distribution? Uh, we, we just need to assume that because we, in, in, in the future, we want my estimates to be a linear combination of my observations. So I kind of need both distributions to, like, if I have a linear combination of a distribution that is Gaussian, it's also Gaussian. So I, that's a, a needed property, and it turns out that it's what we actually need. Okay, that, make, that makes sense. That's, yeah, that's the, okay. the problem that he was trying to solve that is basically navigation. It's, it's a, a Gaussian distribution. And so. you want to exploit the properties of Gaussian yeah. distributions, yeah? Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
So there is like a, a theorem 1A, and this one is interesting, and you will recall a list of squares here. So if we decide that we want our function, like our loss function, to be just epsilon squared, the, my squared error, uh, this theorem true is th theorem one is true without assumptions about symmetry and there is something on the um, I think yes af after theorem one before theorem one there's like a whole proof that why we need the loss function to to uh, be this way and it's related with convexity of the function and some stuff that we're not going to discuss here. But if we force our loss function to be like basically the, the, the penalty that we assign for, uh, for least squares, and this is the one that I want to minimize, so it's kind of looking similar to least squares. So this theorem through, theorem one is always true, that the minimization of this is going to give us the the best estimate. Um, so, what is like in summary? What is the problem that we have now after all the assumptions we we had? So, I I've been given a ver vector value random process x of t, and I have a vector of observations from y at t zero to y at present time. So, I want to find an estimate at future time that minimizes the expected loss, and the expected loss is this. We can see here like these double bars as the norm of the, of the difference of these two uh, vectors. Um, so we have now that we have restricted our loss function to be epsilon square, and as I just mentioned, uh, we also want to restrict our loss function to be a linear combination of our observations. So that's why choosing Gaussian is, is good. Okay, so remember that we talked about uh, vector spaces. So this is why it's, it's important. So let's think about my observations, my observation vector that is y from time zero to time t. So the linear combination of these vectors forms a vector space. So we are going to denote the vector space by this curly y, uh, and it's just uh, a sum over my, my observation times of these coefficients denoted by ai uh, and my, my elements of my vector. So this forms a vector space. So this is actually a finite subspace of the space of all possible observations that we can have. So the, the all possible combinations, uh, observations that we can have is like an infinite space. Um, I think that he mentions on the paper something about Hilbert spaces. If you have time to read a little bit more about it, that's useful for the analysis of the problem, but it's not necessary for, for understanding what we're going to state here. So uh, let's say that we have any two given vectors on this vector space, and let's call them u and v, and they both are on my vector space. So we say that my, we, we know this definition about orthogonality, that if we take just the dot product between two vectors and the, the dot product is zero, so they are orthogonal. But since those are random vectors, I say that they are orthogonal if the expected value of the dot product is zero. So um, using something that he, he describes in the paper that is called a Smith orthogonalization, we can select an orthonormal basis on my vector space, which is basically a set of vectors that are unit length and are uh, orthogonal between them. I can select this and I can say that I can express any vector on my vector space as a linear combination of this basis. Uh, I'm calling this basis here uh, E t sub zero to e, uh, t. So this is important. So 
Yes, I am going to put that example because it's, it's really hard to, to imagine a space with more than three vectors. But this is actually, this is finite, but just try to imagine that you are in a n-dimensional space. So just, just try to think in more than 3D. <laughs> it's hard. So I'm, I'm going to put an example in 3D with this graphic that is really, really poor, but I didn't really have time to make it. I just took this from Google. It has the wrong notation, but it, it's... So my question for this slide is, does that system use the vectors that we talked about? Okay. Yeah, one more time. So is this Y of T still the same uh, uh, vector that you introduced earlier that has three space dimensions and three velocity dimensions? So it's yes. a six-dimensional space? Yeah, this is, is this y vector? is still my observations vector. So this is what I am getting from uh, my sensors or from, from my, and this is what I am transmitting to, in this case of the spacecraft, to deep space network or whatever, of what I am getting from the GPS into my, into my device at my car. So this is what I am observing from the sensors but it doesn't necessarily is the true value because this is what this is about. I, I get a signal, but the signal is noisy. I want to filter the noise from that signal, but I, I don't even know what is the signal and what is the noise. So this, this thing what does is giving an estimate that is better than the signal that you got in your observation. So again, is it a six dimensional vector or yes. not? As for the case of the position and velocity, yes. Uh -huh. This is a still a six-dimensional vector. Okay. So um, in order for the expected value of u dot v to be zero, that's going to be the average over the probability distribution of those things. Is it true that each one of those has to be zero in order for the average to be zero? Or it's true only for the ones that for the ones that forms my orthonormal basis, but right. not for all of them. Okay. Because we need to use this uh, Schmidt technique for finding this basis. It's not that YT1 and YT2 and YT3 are orthonormal between them. It's just that I need to use this and find my orthonormal basis, and I can check that ET0 and ET are, in fact, uh, orthonormal. So, um, like, given that I have this orthonormal basis uh, and I can express any vector in my vector space as a linear combination of these E vectors that we have here, so what I'm going to do, let's say that I have my estimate vector, which is in this case the, the big X, that it could be, but it could not be on my vector space. So. In, in functional analysis, we want our solutions to live in the vector space I am working, but that not, that's not always possible. Uh, so this is the example I have. It's really ugly, but let's say I have a vector space formed by two vectors. So it's a plane. Um, and this is called here E, but it's in fact like my big Y that we have here. Uh, let's say that you have your estimate vector, which is x, the big x, and this vector does not belong to your vector space. It just goes out of this plane. So what we can do, and we can always do this, is that we can decompose this vector x into components. So we can find uh, an orthogonal projection of this vector on my vector space, uh, which is denoted in the graph P of B, but in the paper is denoted by X bar. And we can find the, the orthogonal vector to my vector space. If it's orthogonal to my vector space, it means that it's orthogonal to every vector on, on my basis. So we can always decompose this in X bar plus X, this X tilde, which is the orthogonal component. So 
this is very important because what we, we, we want, and in the paper, they, they developed a lot of analysis around this. What I really want is, okay, if my estimate doesn't belong to my vector space, but I want it to be the closest possible to my orthogonal projection in my vector space, so I really want this, this distance here, like the V minus PV, which is the X tilde, I really want to minimize that. And that's what I am going to try to minimize. And that's why uh, it's important to, to understand these orthogonal projections. So um, given what we say that we can express my estimate as a, as a sum of an orthogonal vector to my vector space and a, an orthogonal projection, so the problem that is stated here on theorem two is like, okay, we have my random processes. One is my, my that state vector and the other one is my observations random vector. There is this assumption that they have zero mean. They, the expected value of them is zero. I, I don't really have clear why he makes this assumption right here, but I, I, I don't really get it why he makes this assumption, but let's say we have this observation vector. So if the random processes that we're talking about are Gaussian, as we mentioned before, or the loss function is restricted to be uh, error epsilon square that we have talked about this before, so it can be shown that the optimal estimate of this uh, x, x t1 given t is given by the orthogonal projection x bar of x on my vector space. So what I really want to find is, is this like blue, is that blue? Yes, like this blue vector that is the orthogonal projection. This is what I want to find. Um, that's the key part. I think you can go to equation 10 and see how is that developed there. Um, but I, I know that that estimate is the one that is going to minimize my, my quadratic loss. Okay, so from now, I'm going to diverge a little bit from the paper terminology. Uh, because they develop how uh, these, uh, the relations between these vectors and the, these estimates are recursive, but I'm going to explain it like with examples, like very, very simple examples. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about recursive list squares, but it's, this is basically the same that is stated on, on the paper. So, um, this is like a very simple example. Let's say that we have uh, 99 numbers, B1 to uh, B99, and I calculated the average of them. And let's call, this is like an estimated average of them, so it's uh, U99 hat. So let's say that a new observation comes in. So this is a new number that comes, and it's B100, and I want to get the new average but I don't really want to solve this system again. I don't want to sum everything from one to 100 again and divide by the number of elements. So I really want just to use my old average, which is like my old estimate, and the new information, like my new observation. So this, I think that probably, I have a joke that this probably came on the GRE exam or like, I, I think I didn't solve it. But this, this can be expressed in, in, in two ways. One way is just, okay, I have my, like my weighted old estimate, and I have the contribution that the new observation makes to my, my new estimate. So the second uh, way to express this is just uh, U99 hat, my one over 100, uh, my new observation minus my old estimate. So we really prefer this second form because as you can see, it's presented in a way that, it's, it's presented in a, a way that I am just updating my old estimate with some quantity. So um, 
we can see here that this term in parentheses, this B100 minus U99 hat, is called the innovation because it tells me, it tells the system how much new information is coming with the new uh, observation. So you can see that if B19, if B100 is equal to my, my old average, so this term is just zero and my average doesn't really change. So this really tells me how much new information I'm adding to, to my system. And this one over 100 that we see here is called the, the gain factor. It's like how much I am like weighting uh, this innovation into my new, um, into my new computation. So this gain factor is like really related with all this control theory and filter terminology because it's just like, okay, this is an input that is being modulated by a gain factor. And if you can see in the paper, all these graphics are like pure control theory, like filter, it's, it's pure control theory. So, okay. So uh, we want to generalize what we just see with this example to uh, the system, the linear system that we saw before and that we solved using like this normal equation trick, like using the A transpose to, in order to, to be able to invert this. So um, I think this, wait, these two slides are kind of truncated. So I have, uh, I have my, like my old matrix with my old set of equations and I have my old state and I have my old observations, but let's say that a new uh, observation came in, like this V new. So this is like a new equation in my system. So I just add a row in A, in my A matrix, I add a row in my B matrix, and I just want to solve for this without solving the system all over again. So using the, the normal equation, I can calculate A transpose, I can calculate again like the, the new A transpose using my new row. Uh, I do this multiplication here and I get uh, this form that we see in the, one, two, three, in the fourth line, um, which is in the form that we really wanted, like a, a known part, the old part plus a new, plus a new part. So, um, the right hand side, like we are going to use the same thing, A transpose plus the new F row that I added to my observations vector. So I finally get this uh, line that I have here, like A T, A transpose old, A old, U hat old plus U T, blah, blah, blah. So going back here. So if I reorganize this in the way we wanted to see it because I, I really, really want to make it in this form. So I have this new estimate, which is my old estimate, plus this matrix A transpose A inverse A transpose new. And you can see again like this uh, innovation uh, term that we have here, including my, my new information. So we call this A transpose A inverse A transpose new. We call this the gain matrix and it's often denoted by K as seen Kalman. Uh, so let's apply this to, to, like, to this very average system that we have here. So in this case, my A matrix is just a column vector because I am just like summing the same value, like the value that the, the state variable takes. And um, I have my 99 observation, so basically my B new is my B100, and my, my A new is just a, a new row on A, which is this just one. So if I solve this system using this equation that we see here at the beginning, um, I get the same, uh, the same result that we get like more intuitively before. So we can see here that uh, since a, a transpose A 
are like this, this column vector by this row vector, so it kind of gets just a scalar, which is 1 over 100. And uh, my A nu is just uh, a, a, a single element matrix, so when I multiply this with my uh, B alt, is like the, I mean, wait, there's a mistake here. It's not B alt, it's U alt. So uh, this, I, I got, using this recursion, I get the same uh, uh, result that we got before. Okay, so now we need to talk about the covariance matrix. Yes. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that there was a linear independence between the columns in the matrix. Um, when you do your updates, how do you know that that linear independence is preserved after the update? I have no idea. Okay, but I assume that it is preserved. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah, it it that may relate to those um, to the a plus and the lambda times. Uh, I think those properties probably factor into the. Yeah, that's an important point because if yeah. you introduce a new row to your matrix, that makes your matrix singular for yeah. some reason. So uh, I cannot longer invert it. So. Right. Doesn't work, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. Maybe okay. we should no. That's investigate fine. that. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think that you have seen all over the place in the paper this covariance matrix. So we are assuming until the last slide that my errors are independent. So, but. Let's say that I am running like some measurements and I'm getting like some observations. Uh, they might be independent from each other, but there might be some correlation between them. Let's say just because they were taken by the same device and this device has, I don't know, a transistor that is getting overheat or something. So I am like kind of like, like transmitting this same mistake or the same flaw to my measure, so they kind of correlated. But right now, for this case, we are assuming that my errors are independent. So if they're independent, that means that the expected value of the errors, like the different errors, the different elements on my error vector, uh, the expected value of the product of them is zero. So because they don't depend on, on each other. So if I have this covariance matrix, it's, it turns out that it's just a, a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix in the, in the I, ith position have the variance of each of the errors. So um, this matrix is always symmetric. Um, and it's just this diagonal matrix. And since I know that this variance is always positive, uh, so I know that this, this matrix is positive definite. When the matrix is positive definite, we know for sure that we can invert it. So um, it can be shown, and it's shown in the paper in, in a more complicated way. It can be shown that if I use a weighting matrix for my normal equation, the normal equation that we saw before, if I use the inverse of my covariance matrix, I use this just to, to introduce the statistical properties of my observations into my system. So uh, it can be shown that this gives us the, the, the minimal error solution, like it, it minimizes my square error. Um, you can go to the paper and, and see the proof. It's, it's kind of complicated, but. So then I want to introduce this weighting matrix into my normal equation, which is now the weighted normal equation. And again, I want to solve for my estimation, which is uh, u hat. So it turns out that all this, this long, operator that we see here, like A transpose C, A inverse, A transpose C. This turns out to be a linear operator, and it can be shown that it's a linear operator. So it, it's represented here by this L. So we got what we wanted. We wanted to represent 
my estimation as a linear combination of my observations. So uh, this is what we wanted. So uh, you can note that if I have um, uh, variance, unit variance here, so all this diagonal matrix, uh, this diagonal is just once. So this is basically like my, my identity matrix. So this becomes my ordinary list squares problem. So after seeing all this, uh, this is the final formulation of the, of the Kalman filter algorithm. So uh, we came to the conclusion that this is like deeply related with the least squares problem, but it's just a general generalization because you're using uh, random vectors because you're introducing like a statistical properties of these vectors. So basically I have like this time varying least squares problem. I want to estimate UK at time k, like time k given my, my past observation. Uh, I have this equation here uh, that uh, my introducing what we saw uh, here before and uh, putting everything in this form using my, my uh, gain matrix, my Kalman matrix denoted by K. So this, this solution have some very uh, interesting property and it's that is recursive. So we are not really storing the observation vectors in, in any place because all the effect that these observations can uh, have in the system are already taken in account in my past estimate that is denoted here as U old. So normally in, in your system you have way more uh, observations that variables that you have on your system. So again, the same example, if you have six state variables, but you have hundreds and hundreds of observations, so we are not really storing that, so it's efficient in, in this way. Remember that we're running this on, on a guidance computer, not in AWS, so this is important. Um, Again, this, uh, this is the innovation factor, and we mentioned this covariance matrix here, but we are like mentioning this covariance matrix again here, and it's a different thing because this is the covariance of the system, on the, of the entire system, not just the covariance of my, uh, of my observations. So this is basically the, the errors introduced by each equation that I add to my to my system. Okay, so there are some new terms here that appear in the in the paper, like with different notation. Um, but basically, the the Kalman filter is a two-step algorithm. So what we want to do first is to predict an estimate of my state variables or variables, my state vector. And I am using, in this first uh, stage, I am not using my input or nothing. I am just using the past state and I'm using something that we call Hilda state transition matrix. That was what I mentioned at the, this is, this F is not my A because my A is just my, my equation of like my observation matrix and this F is the state transition matrix is the one that tells me how the system should evolve in, in time. So it's just like, uh, like the Hamiltonian that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. Um, so I am here just estimating my UK Given my past estimate, I am calculating my covariance matrix for this system, which is in this case uh, denoted by P. We are introducing another uh, covariance matrix that can be there or can be not. Uh, is the covariance of random excitation. 
I am not like 100% sure which this covariance uh, refers to, but that's the, the notation. Um, and then after we have uh, these predictions, what we want is to correct my prediction using the, the, the observation that came into the system. So first I calculate my, um, my, my uh, gain factor, my gain matrix, which is this K right now. And I'm sorry, I will tell you later what this R means. I, I totally forgot what this R is. Uh, but I guess that you're familiar with the rest of the, of the notation. Um, I am now going to update my, my estimate using my past estimate and my, uh, my gain factor plus my innovation, minus my innovation. And uh, I update again my, my covariance matrix. So this is a process that is repeated every time a new observation comes in. Um, okay, so I think here is that from, from here, we know that this, this matrix here, A transpose C, A inverse, it can be proved that it's a tridiagonal matrix because the way that I have here my, my, cover, my weighting matrix, so it's just a diagonal with two off diagonals. So when we have a tridiagonal matrix, uh, we can solve this, we can uh, solve this system by, 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 it's a recursion because we can do a forward elimination and then I can do like back substitution, like the, like th that's how, I don't know, MATLAB or whatever solves these kind of systems. So uh, we don't really need to solve, like to do the back substitution because sometimes all we want to know is just the prediction and the correction, but we don't really want to fix uh, estimates in the past, but we could eventually do that, like because I want uh, my old estimates to solve the normal equation in a better way, I could update uh, by back substitution my previous estimates, but it's, it's, it's not necessary. It's not a necessary step. Um, so what we have until now, what we have to take in account for implementing this, so I have my previous, for the prediction and correction uh, steps, I have my, pre my previous state vector, my predicted state vector, my matrix of observations. Um, I should have put here the, my state transition vector, which is the one that is going to give me the, like how the system behaves, and it's different for, for every system. Uh, I have my vector of observations. I have my predictive, predicted covariance matrix. I have the process noise matrix and the, oh, the observation noise matrix. That's the one. Uh, I don't know what that means. I don't remember. But yeah, all of this is, is put here. Um, so this is like a really poor example of how a Kalman filter works. Um, all I am doing here is I am assuming uh, unit uh, variance, I am assuming, like, I am like putting here like this errors, like these noise matrices are basically um, neglectable. So I don't know if, if you can observe here that the prediction is the blue circles, the measurements are the, and this is like generated from random variables, so the uh, the measurements or the observations are these uh, red triangles, and you can see that my correction is always in between them. So it's um, it's the one that minimizes my my squared error. Oh, this is just like this is my in the in the x-axis is my time and in the y-axis is like the output of my variable of my state variable this is 
like it's an, an imaginary system. This is not representing anything. I, it's, it's not a spacecraft. It's just time uh, and a function of time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, the conclusions is like uh, the Kalman filter is a generalization of the least square problems for dynamical systems, for systems that evolve in, in time, uh, that is computationally more efficient than other solutions like the, uh, like the, the, the winner uh, filter that was not computationally efficient at all. Um, and if you want to get like the, um, the textbook version or the explanation that you get in the classroom for these Kalman filters, I strongly recommend you uh, take this book, Computational Science and Engineering by Gilbert Strang. He's an amazing professor. And um, uh, yeah, just find the book, and go to that chapter and and get the classroom version for this. Um, so I think that's it. If you have questions or suggestions, whatever, let me know. That's it. <laughs> if you want my notes. <laughs> I, I'll send, this is an IPython notebook. I'll send you this later because there are like some other information that is not uh, shown as slides, but there are like some other formulas and some other notes that might be helpful. Questions? Do you use the common filter for anything? At work, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I was wondering if you know where the name comes from because it doesn't seem to be actually filtering anything. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, do you know the the origin of the name filter? Oh yeah, this is this is deeply as I mentioned before. This is deeply related with control theory and signal processing theory. So remember, I mean, remember, not remember, but think about. Um, all these diagrams that you saw in the paper, that those are all like blocks. I, I don't know if you have, if you remember like this, have you ever seen so, like something like Simulink on MATLAB that is just like building blocks and each of these blocks can be a filter that can be just a Fourier transform or things like that. So this filter terminology really comes from signal processing. Like, OK, I have this signal. I want to filter out the noise and get my original signal. So that's where. And same for the gain factor. And this, this is mostly for control theory. It's not, it's not like the uh, cat that filter. No, no. Could you show where the actual filtering is in these equations, just to? The actual filtering, uh, like how I am separating the signal from the noise, you mean? Uh, I don't think so. No. I mean, I cannot do it. And Kalman is dead, so. Yeah. Exactly. It's like he was saying, uh, there's a signal and there's a noise component, X1 and X2, and you filter off the noise component, X2, and you're left with the original X1, but you can only observe the Y, which is the sum of the two. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, but there's a linear regression, right? And in linear regression, Yeah. 
it's, it's, I, I don't think it's quite linear regression because it's not that we are trying to fit this this observations in a line. It's just that we are just trying to filter out the noise. Yeah, maybe the li the linear regression example is the example with the with the line equation that we are like trying to solve this system of cx plus d by but using hundred points. That might be the case of linear regression because I have that's exactly what I am trying to do to fit those points in a line. But as he mentions, as you get more variables and your operators can actually in the paper is stated that you can have actually a non a solution to a nonlinear system using this. Uh, even you can get a, like a, a closed form solution. Uh, I didn't really got in very deep into the nonlinear part uh, because I haven't taken that class yet at the school, but maybe next semester. Um, this is maybe off topic, I'm not sure. But is there any relationship to what you're presenting here and Markov decision processes? Yes, yes. There, there's like some, some relation because I am basically my, this, this Markov chain, it's, it's basically like the time series that I am getting on my observations. So yeah, there is definitely a, a relation. So if I understand correctly, one of the strengths of this is that it can be implemented uh, um, very quickly and simply. Uh, do you happen to know how complicated and large the implementation on the Apollo flight computer was? Um, you can go and check this uh, code on GitHub. Uh, it's assembly, so. <laughs> Uh, but you, you can go and search on GitHub implementations like in many different languages. And they, they, I mean, it's not that we are going to run Python on a guidance computer, <laughs> uh, but you, you can see how easily it can be implemented in an in a, in a expressive language, but in, I, I, in assembly, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if I read those lines, I don't understand, I think. Because are those comments like really weird, like uh, count and skip? Uh, there's a like, like it's it's weird. But <laughs> check it out. You can you can also have it on your GitHub account, and maybe you get an article on Wired or one of these science magazines. <laughs> So uh, regarding the classification of this algorithm as a filter, I would just, uh, is it fair to say, well, looking at that equation at the bottom of the screen, it looks basically like an exponential moving average uh, is your most, uh, yeah. This works like an exponential moving average, so you're basically removing high frequency components of, the, of your observations and keeping the low frequency components or you are attenuating the higher frequencies more than you are attenuating the low frequencies, and that is, uh, by definition, a low-pass filter. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't. It's not really a question. Is, is it fair to say that? Is, I guess it's my question. I I I I wouldn't classify this as a low-pass or high-pass filter, um, because I I I don't know the distribution of my of my noise, so I, I don't really know if my noise is high frequency or not. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure.
Uh, I have a question. Uh, does, this looks like it wouldn't handle um, extreme changes in uh, the the uh, uh, the signal very well. Like if you were going at going along at around you know one and then all of a sudden jump to a hundred, it would take a while to catch up because it would have, have to overcome its bias towards where it had been, right? Yeah, uh, like th that's is actually an, an example of what what happens with with GPS signal uh, when you enter a tunnel or a region with no like coverage. So is is in this case is not that you receive like a peak. Is that you are not receiving anything at all, but you can still estimate uh, what's going to be your like your output in the future and. When you get out of this like black zone, then you can update your estimate. But you are like your GPS still works when you are in in this zone. So it's it, it's actually giving you a a lot a loss function a penalty bigger while you are there. But when you start like getting information like correct information again, you can start like balancing this again. Yes, exactly. So I, uh, hopefully this won't make me look too stupid, but um, based on what I remember from optimal estimation, this is talking about an estimation. And so this is a little bit of a comment, not a question, I, forgive me. But we have to be acting based on where we think the object will be. This is about control systems, this is about the input and control of our vehicle in space. It's not about measuring accurately where we were. It's about making sure we don't die or making sure we hit the target that we're aiming for. Yep. Anything else? Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you.